I would suggest that we have about 15 minutes. I know it's uh, short to have some uh, questions from the audience. So please, when you ask a question, try to ask a question um, and not to give us an entire speech. Uh, we have the mic right there. So let's start with this uh, gentleman right here. Uh, thank you. None of our esteemed uh, panelists mentioned the Amshalem party. So I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are on the p possibility of it passing the electoral threshold and also whether it's at, it could potentially meet the needs of, a, uh, of an existing constituency. Um, it seems to be Tiro, Am Shalem, I should just say, Am Shalem is a party um, so mostly around one individual, Am Salem, uh, who was a former member of Shas and he was kicked out of Shas. And the agenda that he's promoting is a very critical one against Shas, saying he himself is ultra-Orthodox, of course, and it's a party. And he says that Shas is not representing the true interests of its constituents by keeping them out of the military, by keeping at least the men out of the workforce, which means uh, severe poverty for the population, which means a very difficult life for the women of this population. And he is promoting a very different vision of it. Um, I hate to rain on the party. Many people who find him appealing and quite a bit of his support is probably not from the ultra-Orthodox segment population. There's something very appealing about him. It's a new face of Judaism, and it makes so much sense to people outside the community. I'm sure there are also people inside the community who support him. It's important in the sense that this is a message that is being said, and there are parts of it that make a lot of sense to people inside the ultra-Orthodox community itself. There's also a lot of murmur about some of the leaders, even Ari Aderi, understanding that things have to change fundamentally, and there are already some change of, changes afoot. Um, women, for example, and men, gaining secular educations, which usually were not part um, of the religious schools, is, is happening. It's already changing. Um, so there are things happening. I think Am Shalem is, is sort of a symptom of that phenomenon, but I won't bank too much on Am Shalem itself, whether or not Am Shalem gets into the Knesset, it's an important voice. It's, it, it offers us a very different image of what ultra-Orthodoxy can be in Israel, or could be in Israel, uh, but is definitely not where it is right now. Would you like to add on that, uh, Natasha? No, all right. So let's have uh, the gentleman on the back, please. Hi, uh, quick question. How has the contempt by the Prime Minister of the Israeli Supreme Court injunction against the evacuation of the camp that was built, uh, that was being called uh, Bab el Shams in, uh, in Atur, which is, or E1. How's that played in the, in the campaign? Do, do you uh, speak about the Palestinian uh, camp? Yeah, or E1. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The protest camp that was yes. being called Bab el Shams, how's yeah. that? Mm -hmm. that Maybe you'll explain a little bit what it's all about. I, I just don't see that, uh, well, we're talking about uh, basically the protest uh, camp, the protest Palestinian camp that according to Haaretz Czech, for example, was on the land belonging to, to the Palestinians in this E1 area that uh, um, the Israeli Prime Minister announced the plan to uh, to, uh, to start construction, not immediately, but you know, uh, as the time goes, it was uh, it was evacuated. Um, I, I don't think that this issue or several other controversial uh, issues in, in had any impact on on the polls, for example, which is weird because we we really had some. Uh, major, you know, exposures. Uh, we, we had criticism of former head of uh, Shabak Yuval Diskin, who, you know, who told very, very unflattering things about uh, about the security cabinet and how they make decisions, you know, with the whiskey and cigars, etc. Just uh, we had uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, Victor Lieberman that had, that had basically to resign because of uh, of um, um, how do you say, yeah. Uh, allegations of corruption, so he was, uh, you know, acquitted uh, on uh, several accounts. Uh, one remained, but still, I mean, you, you had the, all these cases, and and still, and nothing seems, you know, to to move uh, uh, to to move the polls. Nothing seems to to move uh, um, the uh, how do you say um, what's name? The scale. Yeah, the, to, for for example, to the left, because I think because the center left didn't present any alternative. Well, it's we actually go back to the issue yeah, of ideology. exactly yeah. three leaders of uh, main parties that were supposed to get together and present this unified front against Netanyahu. They just couldn't get together. 
So it seemed not a fight, a ideological fight. It seemed like ego. just ego fight, yeah. and uh, that's. Uh, I think Lapid and uh, Ikhimovic couldn't stand each other when they work together, right? As in the TV. I yeah, mean, but right? as politician, you're supposed to be more flexible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, more questions. Um, the gentleman here in the front, please. Yeah, right, right here. Uh, thank you. Uh, so far, when you talked about settlements, you talked about settlements in general, but I think that most Israelis make a distinction between the settlement blocks, which are basically consensus settlements, and the outlying settlements, which are not. And after all, even Clinton, his parameters, talked about Israel keeping the settlement blocks. The question is, is this distinction even reflected in any way in the election campaign? Does anybody make this distinction? Um, because clearly, if anybody talks about total withdrawal from all the settlements, that's against the Israeli consensus. And I believe that also those who say that Israel needs to keep every settlement also is against the Israeli settlement. Is there any reflection of that in the... I think debate? we see it in the Bennett uh, discussion, partly. Bennett is talking about annexing all Area C, which includes all settlements, including the isolated ones. Uh, there are no settlements outside of Area C. The gentleman asked about E1, and I think this is part of, part of the story. E1 although it is extremely controversial in the world, partly because of the topography of it, uh, in Israeli parlance is considered to be part of the settlement block and is sort of the road between Jerusalem and Maliadumim, which is one of the largest settlements. And so in Israeli um, common perception, it is a very benign kind of uh, settlement, even though in the world, even though all these governments have always announced it and not built there yet, because for the world, and especially because of the geography of the West Bank, this seems to be such a controversial issue. So, but as Moran and Natasha mentioned earlier, the Palestinian issue is almost a non-issue. Settlements, E1, um, certainly the protests. There is, under the surface, a lot of concern about unrest in the Palestinian territories. There's talk about a third intifada. What form could that take? Would this new, the new stuff at Baba Shams, would that be a, a you know, model for a new intifada? But by and large, Israelis, you know, to be perfectly honest, Israeli voters are just sick and tired of the issue. They've been hearing about it forever. Nothing ever happens. The world yells. There's no one to talk to in their, in their perception. Barak tried with Arafat. Olmel tried with Abu Mazen. They never say yes. And so Israelis say, all right, so we'll hunker down. We'll deal with the cost of living or with poverty or with Judaism or with all sorts of other issues that have nothing to do with where the line will be drawn on these elements or not. That's sort of for someone until else. Until there is intifada. Until, until there will be an intifada. Until the European Union will try exactly. to, you know, to press them for... In for general, the right wing, as we mentioned before, has all these strange combinations. It has the Russians and the Haredi and the right wing ideology and the hawks who are security. Behind. All these things are bunched together as long as they're not fractured on some of these issues. But if an intifada comes, or if the United States suddenly pushes on Palestinian issues, or if there's some dip dramatic change, then we may see some of, these, uh, some of these fissures come out. If Netanyahu finds that to deal with the United States, he has to give something on building, there, is, there are people inside Likud, and certainly in Bennett's party, who may not be able to stomach that at all. Yeah. They may not stay in any coalition. They did it to him in 99, they could e or 98. They could easily do it again, easily. It's, it's much more extreme than it was in 98 in terms of the makeup of the parties in his potential right-wing coalition. So a movement diplomatically or a third intifada could really fracture things on the center right. I'm not saying that as some hope. I'm just but then there might be a conflict. For example, Naftali Bennett, one of his most controversial uh, remarks uh, in these yeah. elections were yeah. his uh, interview to Channel 2, I believe it was, yeah. when he said that if he will get an order, because he's still an officer, a senior officer, if he will get an order to, uh, to evacuate a Jew from his home, he won't be able to do it. Jew like, or an Arab, or an by Arab, the way. To be fair, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so later on he said it wasn't, you know, a call to refuse uh, order uh, or anything like this, but he personally won't be able, you know, you can, uh, uh, you can paraphrase it or uh, interpret it as, uh, as you wish. But. Yeah, we have, uh, let's uh, have the, the two questions together, all right? So also the, um, you go first and we lump it together. And uh, we'll thank you. It. I would just like to uh, build uh, slightly on the question about Babel Shems and E1, because um, I think that was more of a rule of law question than a settlements question. And I think your answers were sort of indicative of a new normal in Israel where the Supreme Court's will is sort of, you know, the government will get to it when it gets to it. And I think McGrone was, was an example of this where they only barely evacuated. And I was wondering, um, with a new coalition between a Likud without any of the sort of classically liberal um, MKs, um, Neftali Bennett's movement, which is almost 
in its DNA sort of hostile to the rule of law and Shas, which has theocratic tendencies, where is the rule of law going in Israel? It certainly, from the outside, doesn't look like it's headed in a good direction. Okay, and let's uh, friend ask, and then we... We'll uh, yeah, I have a question, one for Natan, one for Natasha. Um, for Natasha, one of the things you were showing the ads, and you mentioned how one of those ads got taken off the air. There's a one from Balad that got taken off the air. But if you look on YouTube, they just blew up. Um, how has YouTube and social media changed the game and the campaigns? And for Natan, um, I actually just got back from Israel myself for three weeks. And um, one of the things I noticed, two trends kind of going in different directions. Number one, um, Naftali Bennett's party. He comes from the National Religious Party. However, he has MKs in there that are not going to be religious at all. In fact, he talks himself about, we can't no longer, he, I, I heard him speak, he said himself, it can no longer be a party for the national religious, just our sectors, we have to think, it's a problem for us, is a problem for all of Israel. A problem for all of Israel is a problem for us. Um, on the other hand, you have Yair Lapid's party, Shai Piron's number two on the list. He's a rabbi. Yeah. Um, you have the uh, other parties, there's um, Chili uh, Trapper from, mm -hmm. from uh, Labor. You have all of these other parties trying to get the um, this this national religious vote. Um, so, what exactly can you talk a little about that sector of society and where they're going in terms of to the right, to the left, and their parties themselves? Okay, the questions are, are clear. Rule yeah. of law. Let, let's start with the, with the media. Uh, okay. Well, on. with the media, well, obviously, you know, uh, the social media had a big uh, has a very strong presence in these elections. Israelis are addicted, of course, to Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Some, um, there is, for example, former Washington, uh, Amariv correspondent in Washington, Tal Schneider, where her political blog, which is totally independent, is now very, very popular. She is, you know, all over TV shows, et cetera. But, you know, when you see, uh, I think everyone has, every politician has a Facebook page, et cetera. So, some of them are having de uh, debates among them on their Facebook pages. Um, they're still quite polite in Knesset. Sometimes it's uh, much less polite, but you know I think a Maybe good. After these elections, we'll have dislike. Uh, yeah, Facebook, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, I think the good indicator of where you, uh, where exactly is the place to influence. Good example is Stav, uh, Stav Shafir, which was one of the leaders of the uh, tent city protests. Uh, that uh, suddenly, you know, um, the, the joined uh, the Labour Party, and in the, in their ads, uh, she's saying that. You know, this is, we will continue in Knesset was what we started in the street. So Knesset is still the place where actual decisions are, are made. And on uh, the rule of law, maybe? Um, well, it's a complex issue, and I want to do it justice. It, there are, I think, two sides to it. On the one hand, there is something deeply troubling about um, an, a, a long-trend erosion of respect for the Supreme Court. Menachem Begin, the leader of the Likud, is very famous for saying there are judges in Jerusalem, judges in the biblical term of Shoftim, they're judges in Jerusalem, meaning their word, although they were perceived as leftist, elitist, Ashkenazi, anti-Likud, their word is final. That has eroded dramatically. Trust in the Supreme Court has changed, and it is certainly true with the outposts and the settlements. Um, maybe E1 is part of that trend, but certainly it's even more pronounced with the far-out uh, outposts as they're known, which... The Israeli government is not only obliged to in terms of law, but also has promised the U.S. to do many times and simply uh, stalls on and doesn't do and always explains it needs six more months to, to prepare it. Um, but to be fair, there is also a real debate about, about the legal issue, and it actually echoes something in the United States. There's a lot of debate about judicial activism and the extent of judicial review. It's important to remember Israel does not have a fully formed constitution. It has basic laws, which function mostly as a constitution, but partly they function as a constitution because in a very common law system like Israel, the justices of the Supreme Court, and especially in its second hat as a, a court of justice, not a Supreme Court of Appeals in the United States, but also a court of justice that has jurisdiction over just about any issue that a citizen brings before it, the perception in the right wing is that they overreached. We can debate whether that or not that's true, but that is a strong perception. So some of the people who are uh, advocating for change in the legal system and who are trying to promote uh, religious, for example, religious people as a, a polite way of promoting right wing in the Supreme Court, they just had a victory in that, 
They're doing that sometimes for reasons that also have to do with judicial, judicial philosophy. And the two are mixed. At times, it has something to do with the territories, with a deep disrespect for the rule of law. And at times, I think it's more complex, and it's worth giving also credit to, the, to a real debate that's going on. By the way, not just in the right, in general, in legal, in legal circles. Yeah. Finally, just on the, on the religious issue quickly, uh, that's, you know, there are books on that. But in general, I think it's true of Am Salim and it's true of the national religious. There's a blurring of the lines. There's what we call now Khardalim also, who are Haredi, but also national religious, they're both. And Bennett's party has someone who sort of represents that group. Um, and then we have Ayelet Shaked, who's, who's actually secular on the Bennett list. Uh, that's unheard of. And um, especially a woman who's secular. You, you and, also uh, had the Jewish Renaissance movement yeah. who tried to get into the parliament, reform Jews, uh, yeah. Karib, and, and so forth. Absolutely. And yeah. so we have, there, there are big changes, but it still does not look at all like the United States. The reform conservative movements are still very weak. If you say religious in Israel, you mean orthodox. That's it. And for most Israelis, even secular ones who don't believe, what they don't believe is orthodox. Although they started actually, I think, rallying people to, to vote um, in, uh, in, in synagogues this yep. time, the, the reform and yep. uh, in conservative movement, it started. They also kept, you know, kind of uh, uh, far, uh, some distance from politics. This time there were some places yep. that they uh, said that you actually need to, to go and vote and because we need to, to uh, influence the situation. Yeah, By the way, we almost mi missed uh, the Green Party on the verge of uh, getting into Knesset, which is Prima like this is off, yeah. off the agenda for, yes. for years because of security issues, social issues, but you know, uh, climate change, and those guys even threatened, I think, to expose uh, members of Knesset who smoke marijuana. So yeah. this uh, could be very right, interesting. Uh, <laughs> if you are really into, you want to laugh, you just have, have a. Um, look into the different parties that are there. I think there is a representative for everyone from uh, cab drivers to uh, yeah. renovation companies. So um, I want to thank our great speakers today, uh, Dr. Sachs yeah. and uh, Ms. Natasha Mozgovaya. And I can only hope that the next two panels will be as, inf as, as insightful and, uh, and erudite as, as this one. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Thank you.